good evening, everyone. Um, nice to see you. Um, and very nice to welcome uh, Steve Webb. Who I've been, someone's, a good friend of mine has been telling me I should get Steve Webb in for years. So um, finally, I've done it. So, <laughs> Steve Webb of Webb Yates uh, Engineers. Um, there is a great tradition of, uh, of creative and interesting, very talented structural engineers in this country who work very closely with architects and designers. And I think we're very lucky uh, in that respect. I worked in America briefly a long time ago, and there's just, there's just, was very different. There's just, they're very separate and not together in that way. So I think we're, 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 we're blessed. Uh, and what's so nice about what some of Steve's I think he's going to talk about tonight some of the stuff with stone. Um, is using stone again, really for the first time for a long time, I think, uh, as a structural material. Um, oh, good. I'm really glad you're here. Very good. Um, uh, and sort of reinventing it uh, in, for a contemporary environment as a, as a low carbon construction material, which is, uh, is fascinating. So, uh, so great you can be here. Um, there is. You might show it anyway tonight, but there's also there's a very nice short film on YouTube about an exhibition that Steve um, organised a couple of years ago, a few years ago, at the building centre called the New Stone Age, um, where you talk about some of the exhibits. Um, but maybe you'll show some of that tonight, I'm hoping. Yeah. Okay, well, Great. thanks so much. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, how do I change the slides on this, on this one? So we're um, engineering practice. We are 65 people based in London and Birmingham. Uh, we work all over the world, but mainly, mainly here in London. Uh, we do structures, civils, uh, building services, uh, and we try and do everything together. And we work, we try and work very collaboratively with other designers and architects and people like that. We think it's very important that buildings are designed uh, with an equal spread of, spread of agency between the participants in the design so that you end up with hopefully a more rational, uh, rational solution. Um, and I think you know, engineers should be uh, really engaging themselves in the creative process and deciding you know, how buildings are built and, uh, and to some degree what they look like. Uh, we work on all scales and projects. So when we started our, um, well, actually I worked for Calatrava in Spain for a few years and then came back and started Web8 and I knew absolutely nobody. So we started off doing back extensions and loft conversions and any kind of tiny bit of work that people would give us. We still do little projects today. So this is a music room in, uh, near Grimsdyke Farm uh, in uh, Hertfordshire. It's a reciprocating timber grid and it's a tiny project with a budget of, kind of 30k. And on the other hand, we do big, ugly infrastructure projects. This is a 190 million pound underground baggage handling thing at Heathrow Airport. So we work from really tiny to really big. Uh, and I think for us, that's really important that you can try out ideas on the tiny little projects and you can take them up to the big projects. And because you understand big projects, even when they're big, ugly ones like that, um, you know how to, or you can learn how to introduce more innovative ways of building. But um, yeah, so I was going to talk uh, about materials and about the way we build. This is a Neolithic tell. So it's basically a heap of demolition rubble. It was very echoey. It's suddenly echoey. Heap of demolition rubble. Um, there's probably been seven to 10,000 years of occupation there. Every time they build a building, they demolish it, and the ground level goes up and up and up. Uh, that's what a tell is. The oldest bricks in the world were found in a tell called uh, tell Aswad, which is just outside Damascus, and they were mud bricks, air-dried mud bricks, where they'd mix reeds and mud together. And I was really curious, why would they use bricks? And the obvious reason is that that tell, uh, or the town that was there, or the city, was right next to a river. They had reeds, they had mud. Why would they not build with mud bricks? They had sunshine. Uh, kind of made sense. Um, but we design a lot with stone, so I was curious as to why they didn't use stone. So this is the map of where that place is. This is a basalt uh, intrusion there. So it's a big pile of really good building stone. And slightly to the north, you can see all these limestone mountains. But I think this, uh, this town was built in a pre-wheel period, in a pre-iron period. How would they get the stone? How would they get it out? How would they bring it there? So there are very clear reasons why they're building with bricks. Uh, that's that's 7,000 to 8,000 BC. Uh, 4,000 BC are the first fired bricks that anybody found in China. Um, and a similar question. Uh, this, this is where they found them. 
there are mountains right there, why didn't they build the stone? They could just go to the mountain and get stone. Um, there's a reason for beginning to burn clay, and I think um, Barnabas Calder is a kind of energy historian architect, and has a very interesting assessment of um, how architecture develops in relation to energy. And in this case, if you have mud bricks, you need a wall twice as thick, because the mud bricks aren't very strong, so you have to dig twice as big a hole. If you fire the bricks, so you get the energy from the tree and you burn the bricks, the wall can be half as thin. You spend half the time digging the hole and the other half the time sitting under the tree playing a lute or whatever you do. So it's availing the energy of the tree to make less construction. In uh, all over the world, I think before the fossil fuel era, the fossil fuel era is a very short blip. It's 200 years, probably less. Um, uh, before that time, people were building with very little energy. There was very little energy available. The only energy was grain to be fed to oxen to eat yourself, to make movement and, uh, and to build things. Um, so anything that's built before the fossil fuel era is built on a very low energy basis. So in London and all over, I guess, many, many countries in the world, you have this kind of wooden architecture, bits of stone for high status areas stone in Gothic architecture, so incredibly thin, incredibly mathematical stone shapes, but a great economy of energy inherent in these buildings and a great economy of materials. So just using a little bit of oak or as little oak as possible. And it's a kind of, I mean, it, to me, it looks like an early high tech. It's kind of expressing the bracing and the jointing and all this kind of stuff. And, um, so I'm always interested in imagining what the arc of development of this would have been in the absence of the fossil fuel era. But all of this burned down in the fire of London and Charles II decreed that after that, all buildings in London would be built with brick or stone. And again, in London, at that time, you've got clay under your feet. Uh, in terms of volume, you need about 85% clay and about 15% coal to burn clay to make bricks. Uh, and transportation is still a problem at that point. So they're going to bring from Newcastle or other parts of the UK 15% volume as coal, and then they're going to dig up the material in London, they're going to burn it, and then they're going to make bricks. So there's a kind of energetic reason why they were building bricks. The coal era obviously unleashed all kinds of things, actually great prosperity for many people, and, uh, and huge advancement and growth in population, but with it, uh, all kinds of other problems, pollution and carbon and stuff. But in any case, bricks became ubiquitous in London and all over the UK and all over Europe and everywhere else. But at this point, the bricks are structural, they're an aesthetic finish, sometimes they're an internal aesthetic finish, they're thermal attenuation, so they're not insulating, but they're keeping the, the kind of peaks of the temperature out and they're allowing you to heat the inside of the building um, and they're the damp proofing and they're a very durable thing. So they do all of these different functions at once and you can see why, why they use them. And so all over London, terrace houses are built with bricks like this, but then because of damp and because of cold, they decide to split the walls into cavity walls. So a wall which is half as thick is a quarter as strong. So an eight-inch wall divided into two four-inch walls is only half as strong as an eight-inch wall, and suddenly a uh, cavity wall can't span from floor to floor, isn't strong enough. Uh, and so you get this kind of thing. So this is um, supposed to be a good thing. But I look at this with complete horror. I don't have enough attention span to deal with all of these things in the detail. Um, because the bricks on the inside are a little bit too expensive, they change it for block. Because block shrinks while brick expands, you have to put in vertical mastic movement joints. Because the walls aren't strong enough, you have to support them on the structural frame. So you put in shelf angles and things like that to support the brickwork. And then they have cavity trays and trip trays and insulation and wind posts and reinforcement and brick ties and all of this junk in the wall to make this wall stand up. So this has gone from you have mud and reeds by your village, so you know why you build with mud bricks, to suddenly, these are all the things we have to overcome to make the building look like brickwork, which seems completely perverse. So this building, for example, Peter Marber, um, there's brick on the soffits. You know, so, so this is kind of an aberration of logic. And the main issue I have with this is that bricks are really high carbon, with a very, very high carbon footprint. Why are we persisting in building with brick in London? For the same reason, or our attachment to Victorian nostalgia, coal era ideas about durability, are we not driving around in fake steam engines? Seems to me exactly the same kind of thing. So um, 
As engineers, what are we interested in? Or as building designers, more generally, what things are we interested in? So we really don't like buildings to fall over, and I think that's the primary reason why people think they hire engineers. Uh, we can specify just enough material for the building to stand up without it falling over, so we bring some economy by not over-designing things. Uh, an emancipated engineer will make the building more beautiful with the structural intervention, and I think that's what, um, that's what we really like. Um, but also, what kind of employment do we create? So if we choose the material that we're going to build the building with, and I think most people are just knocking up blocks of flats, cladding them in bricks. Oh, we'll put a concrete frame in. That's you know, no further thought than that. But for whom are we creating employment? And what kind of... Uh, we're creating work for machines, or are we creating work for people? This is um, Luigi Nervi, obviously. There's an interesting thing, I think, about tax. If um, manpower or human power is uh, quite expensive uh, and actually taxed, so relatively more expensive because it's taxed. Uh, in, a, in a developed economy, you probably want to limit how much time you spend with, with uh, manual labor or thought or design time, and as a consequence, you maximize materials. So because you put the tax on the people rather than on the materials, rather than on machines, then you make it uh, more interesting economically to um, to economize on labor and use highly rationalized structures. But at this time in Italy, uh, South America, with uh, Eladio di Este, uh, Felix Candela, labor was very cheap and material was much more expensive. And so they had much more time to spend designing, was much more economically advantageous to spend a lot more time designing, a lot more time with people making intricate form work and false work to save material. So if you wanted an environment that used less material and was a little kinder on, in carbon terms, lighter buildings, then if you move the tax from the person to the material, suddenly people will be paying form workers and carpenters and engineers and architects to come up with far more economical, more interesting ways of, of building. Uh, people are constantly espousing CNC, robotics, uh, toothpaste, uh, cement, uh, printing, uh, 3D robotic arms, and all this kind of stuff. And we imagine that we're all going to be rich people sitting around being served by robots. But actually, all the people that were put out of work by this movement, and as I said, machines don't pay tax, where are they going? Universal income. So maybe it's good when we decide how to build a building that we create employment, and that we create good quality employment for people, rather than trying to avoid employment by maximizing material or using robots or other things. So as a practice, we, um, we try and make moral choices about what we do, and we don't always get them right, and we're not always that consistent, I have to say. But, um, and there's a lot of complexity about carbon particularly. So people say, you build a building, embody carbon, or carbon in use. Is carbon in use more important than embody carbon? Is it important to make the air conditioning efficient, and who cares about the frame? Is it important to make the frame efficient? So I think... Uh, at this point, now that we insulate buildings quite well, the frame is where most of the carbon is coming from, and it's coming out now when you build a building. It's not coming out in 40 years' time when you're air conditioning the building. Um, there are lots of metrics and uh, spreadsheets for calculating this kind of stuff, but for me, if the process has a huge factory with fire inside it, it's probably a bad thing, um, whereas actually quarries and forests you think are relatively benign. If, um, if we have to have a beam performing a structural duty, so in this slide, uh, that beam, the two-meter beam supporting a one-ton car, all of these sections on the top are strong enough to do that. So you have an eight-inch by four-inch timber section, slightly narrower engineered timber and hardwood, only 2.1 millimeters of steel. So these are all like for like, strong enough to do that. It's strong enough to support that car. Uh, 22 millimeters of post-tension stone. Most sections are sized for stiffness. So the concern is that something's too bouncy or wobbly. It's not really whether it's strong enough or not. So those are all the equivalent sections of stiffness. And below that are the carbon footprints. So you think steel's really strong, so I use less of it. So well, therefore, maybe I'm better for the environment using steel. But actually, the steel section, even though it's tiny, has a massive 22 kilograms per meter of carbon. The timber is much less at five, and the, the green is a minus 16 kilos 
of sequestered carbon by the tree. So the tree swallowed up a lot of carbon dioxide when it was growing. If you're building rots or sets on fire at the end, then all the carbon dioxide is out again. So I don't quite know whether that's right to count. But stone, interestingly, is even lower in the short term than timber because stone is much stronger and its extraction process is very similar. It's just cutting it, pulling it out of the ground. So the choices we make about how we build a frame make a huge difference in carbon terms for what we do. So in my office, for example, they were saying, uh, can we join the climate change uh, protest in uh, Trafalgar Square? And I was like, who do you think they're protesting against? Oh, they're protesting against carbon and the industry. You know, who is that? Oh, you know, people uh, manufacturing stuff, you know, like the stuff that we specify, yeah. So they're protesting against us, right? <laughs> it's like, so let's go and walk along next to them and pretend that we're in agreement. You know, actually, we should stay in the office and design more timber buildings. So we should really take some moral responsibility for this. And if you're eating locally grown tomatoes and cycling to work and you're working you know, for your architectural practice, designing new London vernacular biscuit buildings, you are the problem, despite the uh, locally grown tomatoes and the cycling, <laughs> which are relatively insignificant in comparison. So, uh, so we're interested in stone as a possible solution. We routinely take limestone at 100, 200 newton strength we get uh, one of these, crush it up, we get a load of gas and burn it, we turn it into cement, we get uh, water, which is in, or fresh water, which is in short supply, and sharp sand, which is in short supply. So desert, wind-blown sand doesn't work for um, concrete, so there's a shortage of sand. We put up form work, false work, reinforcement, back propping, uh, we vibrate it, we put releasing agent on it, we strike the back propping, we get the shuttering off, and hey presto, we have a material with a strength of 40 newtons. So this does not seem a little perverse <laughs> to everyone that we went through all of those processes to end up with something that was weaker than the thing that we had in the first place. People have said, is stone sustainable in the sense of its replenishability? And um, somebody asked me at a talk, what happens when all the stone is used up? And I was kind of imagining this cluster of office buildings circling the sun because we've consumed all the stone on the planet. All building materials come out of the ground anyway. If every one of seven billion of us had a five by five by 200 mil thick stone slab for their house or whatever, or uh, uh, it would be a single quarry, 40 kilometers square, 20 meters deep. So you can see that the volume of stone ge uh, geologically is immense, infinite, compared to any kind of edification that we could, um, we could do. And I'm kind of, I mean, we really, we try and build with timber a lot, and I like timber, but I'm also, slightly suspicious about the, um, uh, the upscalability of timber in terms of tackling climate change. So we're looking at this, made up this uh, totally invented unit, meter cubed newtons per year. So how much material, how strong in newtons and per year of production. So how much land use are you making on this five by five square meter patch? So in a tree, you get one and a half cubic meters, 75% of the tree trunk turns into planks, uh, seven and a half newtons. Underneath the tree, 500 cubic meters, 75% used, 150 newtons in three months. So 0.336 meter cubed newtons per year compared to 224,000, it's much more powerful with the land to quarry than it is to grow trees. And I think that uh, um, photo of the Estead quarry in the Louvre really tells the story that you can see how much wood is in the tree and how much stone is underneath the tree. So um, uh, stone as a structural material died out with the advent of concrete, I guess, and steel. Um, and I guess at that time, people thought that coal and unlimited energy was going to release uh, everyone. And also, I think it wasn't so easy to um, to reinforce stone because of the availability of industrial diamonds and different things. But there is some continuity stone architecture in London, Portcullis House, uh, Hopkins, um, Cambridge, Finsbury Square with Eric Parry. Um, but after the war in France, they had what they called austerity construction and they had a shortage of coal, so they couldn't make steel and concrete. Um, and they gave money to quarries to cut up um, a standard block. And this architect, Fernand Pouillon, adopted this as his kind of stylistic move in the 1950s, and he built lots of housing in Marseille and North Africa using, um, using automatically uh, extracted blocks. So this is the Totem Tower in Algiers, 
It's 62 meters high and right in the middle of an earthquake zone and it's just load-bearing stone block all the way up. Uh, and this is in Marseille, um, similar thing actually, concrete hollow pot slabs inside but totally load-bearing stone walls. That's that. So in France, I mean, A, they have more space. B, they have probably better geology of limestone and, um, uh, and a more industrialized quarrying sector, probably as a result of the investments that happened when they were building these buildings here. So you get quarries like this that are quite, quite industrial, quite organized. On the other hand, we, we have some projects in Kenya, and I was in Nairobi recently. This is outside uh, Nairobi in a suburb called Thika. And um, it's kind of typical geology for that region. It's tough on top, which is uh, cemented volcanic ash. And underneath, it's trachyte, which is a larvic uh, intrusion. So they use both of these um, in buildings. The quarry is very, very unsophisticated. People with hammers um, uh, and no plant at all. But they use um, the top. Um, stone for light duty block work, and they call the bottom one foundation stone. And this stuff is cheaper than concrete per volume, which is amazing. So, so we're doing projects where we're taking concrete out and we're replacing it with this stone because the stone is cheaper. And I think that also has something to do with the tax situation, that they're paying tax in the concrete mill, but these guys are probably not paying any tax. Um, you can see this in the wall. So the trachyte is underneath and the tuff on top, and I think it's really interesting how the wall looks exactly like the, um, like the ground. Um, but all of these buildings, all of the blocks, if I, you know, if I asked you, you'd say that was concrete block work, but actually it's all stone. This is Thika. All of those gray walls are stone from that quarry. So, so, and not for any, I don't think with any environmental purpose, just by an accident of economics, it's massively decarbonizing. And, uh, uh, and totally feasible in that economy. Um, stone is generally much stronger than concrete in compression. It's much stronger than concrete in tension, which is important, so you don't have to use so much reinforcement. Uh, it's also much stiffer. And concrete, when it sets, it has a lot of water trapped inside it, but the water evaporates and the concrete shrinks, and when you compress the concrete, the water escapes. So you have these long-term movements of concrete that you don't have with stone. Uh, it's a naturally occurring material, so we have to test it. We take lots of samples. We have a big factor of safety that we stick on all of those because of things like this. So this uh, ammonite is right in the middle of the sample. We couldn't see it from the outside, but it has a big impact on the strength. So we tend to be very um, cautious with the strength, strength properties. We, we got into stone, as I said, when we started our practice, we had no work, so we used to design staircases for, for people. Um, this is a traditional stone cantilever stair, and it's this kind of strange structural um, effect. The tread at the top is taking its support from the wall and the tread underneath. And the tread underneath is supported from the tread below that. So you get the force coming down at the back, resisted upwards at the front. The tread in the middle wants to twist out of the way, but because it's built into the wall at the end, it can't twist. So this is how a stone cantilever stair works. If it was a real cantilever, you can build a stone into a brick wall. If you jump up and down on the end of it, you'll very quickly uh, bust it out of the wall. So it's this kind of funny turning a moment into a torsion mechanism that um, supports all of those stone, stone cantilever stairs all over London. So we made a plywood version of that, and we used to make all kinds of analogous wooden versions until eventually stonemason, uh, the stonemasonry company, or Pierre Bideau, who we worked with for many years, um, found us. and set us to designing traditional stone stairs. So these are more modern um, versions of traditional stairs. And it's, so yeah, so this tread is sitting on that tread. This one's sitting on the one underneath. And because they can't twist out of the way, all of the load for the staircase eventually ends up at the bottom. The cables there are just um, containment instead of balustrading. But they had an issue in the sense that they can only sell a staircase to someone who has a flight adjacent to a wall. And actually, there's a huge market for free-spanning staircases. So we started looking at reinforcing the stone and how we could post-tension it. So this is an early prototype, uh, four stone slabs, 50 millimeters thick, two 8 millimeter cables running through them. The cables sag slightly. So when you pull the cables tight, they lift the weight of the stone. They push the stones together. So we're able to make a 3.2 meter span in 50 millimeters thick stone with the two cables. So this is very, very effective. 
none of us thought to take a decent photograph of this at the time, but uh, <laughs> we were uh, happy that it worked. Um, and yeah, they're designing staircases. So we got into the staircase market with, with reinforced stone. And we um, started off with short flights and slightly longer flights and short helixes until eventually we got to this one. Um, th this is a sketch diagram. Each individual stone has two holes in it. The cables go through the middle of the holes. The cables are tightened by a jack. So we pull the cable with a jack. This case with 12 tons pushes all the stones together so they can't slide and they can't, um, they can't open up. So it gives the stone additional tensile capacity. We did some early testing. It didn't work. Eventually it did work. Um, and we built things like this. So we've done 40 or 50 of these staircases all over the world now. And um, it's just stone and two cables. So um, a very, uh, yeah, much more slender than it would have been if it would have been a concrete stair over clad, much less cutting, because you haven't got to cut all of the cladding around a pre-existing structure, fewer subcontractors. So it's quite a, I think, quite a good way to, um, to build. But um, yeah, so we've done hundreds of staircases. I'm so sick of designing staircases. <laughs> but, um, but what I was thinking is this is quite an audacious structure in reinforced stone. Why are we not making more ordinary things? So, and we even got to this, uh, this uh, vertebrae one here. But, um, what we're really interested in is making more ordinary components. So you can make beams, cut stone blocks, put a cable through the middle, you post tension the cable with the jack, uh, you hold the cable into the stone with a cuff and wedges. So the wedges stick into the cuff and they hold the cable in the stone. Um, you can do the same thing with slabs uh, and columns. So uh, really very easy. And I think what really appeals to me about this is that if you're building a steel beam, you're going to make a steel beam, you go to Brazil, dig an iron ore mine, take it to a blast furnace, take it to a blending mill, take it to a rolling plant, put it in a fabrication shop, all of the things that go to make a steel beam, lots and lots of big industrial processes and obviously a massive carbon footprint. Here, to cut these blocks, I need a circular saw, I need a drill, I need a bit of cable and a jack. I can put these pieces of plant in a suitcase so I can make the equivalent of a steel beam with a plant that I can fit in a suitcase in a quarry nearby. So not only is it potentially more local, less transportation, but it's quite democratizing because anybody can make this. You don't have to have a blast furnace. So, um, we, uh, so we're a tiny company and we have an R&D budget of about 50 pence. Um, but we, because this is a new area and because nobody else is doing it, so there are no codes, there are no very few precedents. There are one or two buildings with post-tension stone, but not many. And the people who design them are not um, publishing their, uh, their data. You really have to break new ground technically. And um, I think what's very interesting is that the very, very tiny amounts of R&D when you know nothing are hugely illuminating. So the kind of learning curve for a very little spend on R&D gives you huge amounts of knowledge, relatively speaking. So we've done lots of tests. Um, uh, Wendell Sebastian is the head of special structures at UCL, so we do some uh, projects with him. This is testing one of those beams to construction and a workshop. <coughs> we were very concerned that Obviously, limestone, as I showed in the earliest slide, if you burn it, you get cement. So we're thinking if there's a fire in a building like this, it's just going to turn into a heap of, um, heap of cement. But we did a fire test. And again, because of the water in the um, concrete, when you burn a concrete beam, the water turns to steam, and it blows the face off the concrete and exposes the rebar. The rebar melts, and the beam falls down. Um, because the stone doesn't have the, the water trapped inside it, it doesn't explosively spool the post-tensioning bar is quite a long way inside. So this beam, um, which is spanning six meters and carrying two 10-ton loads, lasted for three hours in, the, in this fire test. So actually, stone was really good in a fire, which um, initially you think stone would be really good in a fire. And then you think about the chemical processes in the stone, and you think maybe it isn't. And actually, um, it was OK. Uh, so we, um, yeah, this is the uh, new Stone Age exhibition. Canary Wharf was saying, if you wanted a stone floor in a building, could you do a 12 meter span? So we did a 12 meter span. So this thing spanning 12 meters, um, carrying full office load. It's two post-tension beams, and it's designed so that the, the plate on top acts compositely. So when this sags, this castellation in the bonding on the edge of the stone puts compression into the top, 
top plate. Uh, this is a kind of prototype. And then more recently, at the summer show, we put this thing in. Um, it's 5.5 meter cantilever supported on the timber frame. So here, um, we worked out if it was a steel and hollowed slab, which would be a kind of more ordinary solution to that, it would have 15 times more carbon footprint. So steel compared to stone, as I said in the earlier slide, makes a huge, huge difference in, uh, in carbon footprint. The other thing we're saying here is that stone can be light and timber can be strong. Actually, timber can hold up stone. You don't have to have stone holding up timber. So, um, this is um, Stone Masonry Company's plant. So we're working at the moment on, on several stone beam projects, but one of them particularly big. Uh, it's the production line for stone beams. So you can see the anchorages. These are grout tubes, so they grout the tendons in um, and jack them up. Uh, and that's uh, that building, which is an Amin Taha project under construction at the moment. So you can really, um, you know, even now you can scale it post-tension slabs. This is Clerkenwell Close. So this is another, it's an idea about how big you can build in stone. In this case, it's a concrete frame on the inside of the building. Well, not a frame, just slabs, actually. There's a concrete core, so the, um, so the building's stable because of its core and just slabs. Um, the stone, which is the, on the perimeter, is supporting all of those concrete slabs. What you don't want is uh, different subcontractors trying to occupy the crane full time. So if you have a concrete contractor who's wanting to use the crane hook time continuously, then you can't have somebody slowly lifting in pieces of stone at the same time. And similarly, the stone guys need it all the time. So you can't have those two subcontractors on site at once. If, um, if they were the same subcontractor, you could have them on site at once because they'd obviously figure it out between them. But um, uh, So what we did in this case was build all of the concrete and leave in the back propping and then build the stone around the outside of it and then remove the back propping at the end. So the stone supports that concrete or those concrete slabs all the way up. The stone gets slightly smaller at the top because it's less loaded and you can see, for example, on the corner where there's very little load, it's much skinnier. And there are three finishes here. So the architect is, um, well, he would tell you a story about how the, uh, uh, how the act of making has inflected the architectural style. Um, actually, you drill plug and feather, so you end up with this finish with these kind of half circular cuts through it, and then you split it from the bed. So you end up with this really gnarly um, split bed finish full of fossils, and then you saw it into different shapes. So actually, it's much cheaper, and it's much less work. So this is the quickest and easiest way of getting lumps of stone of that dimension out of a quarry and onto the building. And so I think it's really kind of pragmatics becoming a, an expression rather than a, certainly not an intentional thing. And we're working on a 10-story one in Finchley Road at the moment, which just topped out. But what I was, we was in, uh, we're in uh, Mallorca recently, and um, they're building social housing like this. So this is Marais uh, Sandstone, and they're building, I think, like a 1,000 social housing units. And everything in Mallorca was previously made of stone and they want to continue that tradition. And they have loads of stone there. I mean, the whole island is a big lump of stone and they can dig holes and get stone anywhere. So they're building like this, stone in compression, massive stone walls, a big volume of stone and an entirely stone building. And I think in contrast, in Northern Europe, Switzerland, Austria, Finland, um, there's a lot of forestry. And so everyone's building in solid CLT. But in the UK, we're kind of stuck in the middle. We don't have that much timber and we don't have that much stone either. So what is... Um, style for us. So the guy that's commissioning these social housing things, he said to me, the world has 7,000 languages. Why doesn't it have 7,000 architectural styles? Why aren't the architectural styles more responsive to the place and to the available resources and all that kind of stuff? So I was thinking, well, it's kind of interesting and something that we've been working on. So we, um, prior to that, have been designing, uh, this is Wimbledon College of Art. We want to make a really lightweight, sustainable building, but a lightweight building um, predicates a certain amount of overheating. And we do the M&E and the structure together. So our M&E guys are telling us, you know, if you do a timber building, we're going to have loads of air conditioning. If we do a concrete building, we won't have any air conditioning. So the obvious way of uh, solving that dichotomy is you have a timber building with a very small amount of concrete in it in the, in the soffit. So we built this building, concrete 
uh, slabs supported on timber beams, we calculated that we only needed 50 millimeters of concrete to take the heat out of the air during the day, and then at nighttime the windows open and the concrete cools down again. So it took away all the air conditioning. This building got Briam, outstanding. It actually exports um, electricity to the grid, and it has this kind of funny timber supporting concrete thing. So we scaled that up to um, the Anna Freud building. So this is a 17 million pound building. It's an old warehouse. This building has quite a high carbon footprint per meter because we built a city centre basement. Um, uh, but all of the above ground floors were timber. And this time, Baubucher, which is um, beach LVL, so laminated beach, is very, very strong, and um, 90 millimeter precast concrete planks on top. And composite. So, composite means when the timber beams bend, they compress the concrete on top. So the concrete and the timber work together to span. So we get a shallower timber beam and use everything together rather than hierarchically. So these um, uh, bolts are what connects the timber to the concrete. So when the timber beam deflects, it squeezes the concrete above. Uh, and for the same reason, that meant that this building has no air conditioning. The windows open automatically at night, and the concrete cools down. And then in the daytime, it closes up. And, um, that's very energy efficient, and uh, otherwise it's a sort of passive house design. Uh, so we've done this quite a few times, but we're thinking, how do we decarbonize this further? Well, obviously, remove the concrete and put stone back. So we're now working on a whole series of projects where we're combining timber and stone, and we're thinking, as the Mallorcan example, massive stone is their solution because they have lots of stone underground, uh, and in northern European countries, CLT is the solution because there are trees everywhere. For us, maybe a a vernacular solution is a mixture of, um, of stone and timber. So here we've got, um, so it's a post-tensioned stone beam across the back of the house. This is a tiny extension. So this is a perfect project to try something like this out on. Post-tensioned stone beam carries lateral stability, spans across the back of the house. It's on a timber post over here. We've got stone columns here, firmly broken supporting a timber beam that supports all of the weight of the back of the house. And then in between the two, uh, timber joists and stone plates, composite with the timber joists in between. Um, so inside it's going to look like that. And I think, um, you know, visually, this is kind of really interesting. They're natural materials. It works from, a, uh, from, a, from an energy... Um, uh, cooling and um, uh, environmental engineering perspective, and and it's using you know what we've got in a way that gives you something useful and specific to him. Uh, another thing we've been working on is a um, is a kind of torsion locked floor. So we were asked to exhibit something at the V&A, and uh, we thought we'd test out this idea as so, you know, an excuse to try something out. Um, this um, slab. Is made of 40 millimeter thick limestone plates. Uh, each plate is 500 millimeters square. It's supported along the edges, on all four edges, and it spans from one side to the other. And there are no, there's no reinforcement, no tendons, no tricks, just individual stone plates. One plate sits in the corner and it's supported on three points. So you can see that it's stable because it's held by those three points. The next plate is held on those two points and supported on the previous plate. This one's supported on that plate. So these diamonds are just little um, washers that hold one slab next to the other. So in the end, we're able to span three meters, 40 millimeters thick stone, unreinforced. We built this in an hour, uh, and it was relatively cheap. So we're using this. So I think it's amazing that you can, you know, you had a tiled floor and you had a concrete slab underneath. You didn't need the um, concrete slab after all. Um, we're using that same principle to build this truncated vault for the Grimsthorpe Art Museum, which is going to be, this is a prototype, but the real one's going to be a 10 meter span. So it's using that torsional interlock. These are 150 mil stones. Again, no reinforcement um, at all. And we're thinking that we can put all of these things together to make a system. So we can do what we do with the post-tensioned uh, stone beams and post-tension columns. And uh, put the uh, thing together and make frames like that. 
instead of concrete frames. So somebody was telling me, oh yeah, that's all very well, but what are the logistics of carrying stone around like that? I was like, what are the logistics of carrying a liquid material around on a truck with a revolving tank on the back that goes hard after an hour and a half? <laughs> it's just completely... People, and the reason for talking about the bricks in the beginning is that people in construction, we just keep doing what we've always done. And we never look up and think, why are we doing this? You know, we keep making brick buildings. For what? You know, it's a totally outmoded uh, thing. With the climate crisis, why are we building with concrete and steel when we could be building with, um, with stone? How do we change the way that we, uh, we build? And how do we find a style that really reflects our circumstances and where we, where we are? Um, so I think what's really, I mean, what I find very interesting is um, obviously stone is a very old material, but it's a new material for us, and we're using it in a new way. And I think when, for example, Iron Bridge was built, it's built by a carpenter. And when you look at Iron Bridge, first cast iron structure in, uh, in Telford, all of the joints are little wedges and mortars and tenons. So it's carpentry, uh, carpentry psychology making this bridge. And you realize, of course, because they've only ever worked with wood. Suddenly they're working with wrought iron. And all they can imagine is that it's a much stronger kind of wood. Um, and I think when they first started building concrete, they built Gothic cathedrals in concrete as if it was stone or neoclassical buildings um, because they thought concrete was a new stone. And eventually concrete through Bauhaus and other things adopted its own style. And I think for us, we don't know whether stone is like column and beam construction like steel. We don't know whether it's slabs or is it arches and vaults. So really it's... Um, it's kind of very interesting because it's fresh. It's a material looking for its own language, whether it's a kind of um, hybridized timber and stone or post-tension stone or looks like precast concrete or, you know, what, um, what does it want to be? And uh, so from 7,000 years ago to uh, Blade Runner, I mean, stone's very powerful. It's very strong. We can build big with stone without a massive carbon problem. That's the end. Tension stone. Um, what is the first example of that being used? Do you know? Uh, I don't know that I know what the first example is. Um, uh, Emmanuel, oh, um, Peter Rice's Seville Expo has post tension stone arches. In but it. Are there any old, older examples like, in history? I don't know about So I think the reason that they haven't done post tensioning earlier and the reason that post-tension stone didn't happen instead of concrete is because they didn't have diamond drills, they didn't have high tensile steel, they didn't really have hydraulic jacks. So they dropped stone for concrete because they could pour the concrete around the reinforcement. Uh, so I think, um, I'm trying to think, I mean there are more recent examples, so there's um, Port Callis House, Emmanuel College in Cambridge, the Peter Rice one, um, what's, uh, what's the name, Rongole and uh, What's his name? Soufflo and Rongole, who did the uh, Pantheon in Paris, started reinforcing the stone with iron. Mm. And they spent the next 150 years picking the iron out and fixing it because it was rusting and destroyed everything. So quite often putting steel in a structure with water is a bad, right. bad idea. But it's like. also it's quite strange visually because you can't see the tension cable. So it sort of defies logic. Like, because uh, if you... It, in a way like stone cladding that, that you couldn't, if it was just stone, it couldn't span yeah. those distances. So it's got a quite a sort of surreal, gives it a surreal kind of Yeah, quality. I think um, when you, yeah, if you see a piece of stone jointed like that, you would assume it's cladding a steel beam. Uh, yeah. And I guess it's, uh, I mean, is it honest? Is it not honest? You can't see the bar, so it's dishonest. The stone's in compression and it's sat there, so, it's, so in that sense it's honest. Uh, if you had an exposed concrete frame, you wouldn't be saying that you couldn't see the reinforcement. But, um, I think so. I really like the argument that we expose the structure and we have an honest, you know, truth is beauty and all this kind of stuff that we actually show how the thing is built. And when we're, we're working in France and French engineers who are pushing stone are like purists. They want arches, they want vaults, they want load-bearing stone walls. And they're like, oh, you English people contaminating uh, your so stone with paradigm. reinforcement. Oh, yeah, is, he would never he do that. Is he against what you're doing? Yeah, yeah, he would not like that. Oh, yeah. I see. Right. But, um, but he's got... 
you know, a shitload of stone right outside his front door. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> we have a little bit of stone and uh, bits of cable and uh, bits of wood. So, um, but yeah. It's, Interesting. Uh, Um, what do you think about the uh, um, stonemason? And as I see, you have some small project. And so, what do you think, like the, in the UK, like the stonemason? Like how many of them, and is it easy to get them? Because it, I think it's very uh, interesting to use. Yeah. Them. No, there are so. Um, yeah. So the interesting thing is, how do you create? You know, do you create employment? So they're asking my friend Pierre, who's a stonemason, why don't you see and see it? And he says, what's the matter with creating jobs for people? You know, and actually, uh, he's saying it's quicker to um, for a person to work a piece of stone than it is to put it on a three-axis or five-axis CNC and then recalibrate it and keep turning it over and stuff. So it's actually quicker to build it manually. There are a lot of stonemasons in the UK. Stone has tended to be a decorative or a restoration enterprise. And uh, whereas this idea about making big post-tension stone beams needs to be industrialized like concrete. So I think the people who would take something like this forward are probably not the people who are fixing cathedrals and doing um, novelty mantelpieces. But there are some stonemasons, and stonemasons can be trained. Um, but I mean, this is not, you know, this is an idea and it's uh, in an embryonic state. It has, uh, and although we're building quite big buildings with it, it's got limited feasibility for upscaling until somebody, you know. But I think CLT in 1995 would have been the same. You know, people would have said, oh, CLT, solid timber, too expensive. You know, is it really practical? And how many carpenters are there? That kind of thing. So, could, uh, and I think with increasing gas and oil prices, Concrete and steel also become relatively expensive. So, sorry, that was the totally tangential answer to your question. Um, I had a question about the social housing in Mallorca. It's really beautiful. <laughs> and I wondered, firstly, is that to do with the cost of the reduced cost in using the local stone? And secondly, is that something you think could be replicated in the UK in producing sort of well-made and affordable social housing here? Yeah, I mean that, yeah, so the, I mean that, um, they have, so they have this way of cutting blocks, which I haven't shown, which is basically a big circular saw on a little kind of bicycle thing that goes through the quarry and, uh, where did I put it? Sorry, it's further back. Um, so they produce these blocks at that size very, very cheaply and very efficiently, and they have stone, and it's local, so it's really economical. And so here, and not only that, but they save the finish, so you don't have to decorate it, and, um, uh, and they save the concrete and steel, which is all imported to Mallorca. So for them, it's economically viable. Um, I don't think, I mean, as I said, we don't have that volume of stone in the UK. So, well, we do have a volume of stone. We don't have that many quarries. So. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it could be. Um, I, I'm interested in mixing timber and stone because I think we have, you know, we have those sorts of materials available. Uh, Gilles Paradin is building in France similar to this, just really massive fat stone walls. And I think we just, uh, we don't produce stone in that way and it wouldn't probably work for us. Do you know of any social housing in the UK that's already combining timber and stone? Uh, there's timber social housing, isn't there? Um, I don't know about stone. There might be some Barrett homes in Bath that are <laughs> like made of stone and timber. I know, um, I mean, Taha, who we work with um, a lot, is working on a project for a 30 story timber and stone tower in Bristol, Castle Park, which will no doubt have an affordable element in it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the social, yeah, the blog that he did where you can see the saw marks and, uh, yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. Hello, thank you for the really illuminating talk on this material. I was wondering what the, uh, what's probably the biggest difficulty you found in working with this material in the kind of whole process? Where are the, like, big challenges um, for you? 
Yeah, there have been loads. I mean, I personally, I really like it because there are no codes. I just hate pouring through regulations and <laughs> being told that I've missed a subclause of a subclause or something. So you invent everything from first principles, but that's also one of the biggest problems, that you buy concrete and you say, I want 40 Newton concrete, and they give you 40 Newton concrete without too much debate. Whereas we go to a quarry and see a piece of stone, we have to send it for testing. And, um, it's no certification, so we take responsibility for statistically working out how strong the stone is going to be and make up our own codes and our own ways of analyzing it. So those, um, you know, and there's not a huge number of, you know, they're quite a, there are a few stonemasons who would build buildings like this, but not a massive number. And then obviously clients don't, by and large, want to take risks. So you have to kind of um, fly a stone solution in under the radar slightly. So there are lots of... Um, so some of the problems make it interesting, actually, for, for us anyway, I think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there are plenty of problems. I mean, it's not, um, not plain sailing. Are we constantly... Uh, so we don't know how... So we're quarrying, and we take samples on the quarry face. And oh, we're not quarrying, we're buying from a quarry, but they're pushing across a, a bench. And we take some samples, and we assume that a few months later, the stone is different, so it might have a different strength but we keep getting confounded by the results. And so we were thinking more recently, actually the stone probably is the same on a, across a bed because it had the same climatic conditions and compression at that point, and maybe six inches above it's totally different because the weather was Jurassic, weather was different at that point. Uh, and so actually we should be taking vertical samples and just assuming that, you know, like Brighton Rock, you know, that the strength characteristics go through. So things like that, you know, getting constantly designing a building, getting to tender, getting to site with a stone that we think has a really strong flexural resistance and suddenly they do a load of samples and it's much weaker and we're stood there with a load of stone blocks and a massive problem and an angry uh, client. So, I mean, there's lots of uh, all kinds of things too. Um, but all those things are solvable, I don't think, um, but by smarter people than, uh, than me, that's for sure. Just a question, uh, just relating to what you just said. Um, so a student of mine last year did the stone building, and he went to to the to the quarry and did some research about it, and actually found out that there is a majority of offcuts if you want to get the stone you want to get. Yeah. And I can't remember the percentage, That's but huge. I think it's yeah. huge. Yeah. So his project kind of changed, and actually thinking of how to use the offcuts. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's not even the offcuts. It's reject block. Yeah. So if you yeah. if you go to a marble quarry, they need to fence the quarry off to stop people from falling into it. So I think they have a conversation in the porter cabin by the quarry, and they say, "Shall I get some chain link in?" Oh no, 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 no. Chain link's too expensive. Let's fence it off with one meter cube marble blocks. So because they have waste block, they have piles and piles of huge marble blocks that are waste because they're the wrong color. Because uh, an architect's gone there and said, oh, I don't like that bit. <laughs> so they have huge fields of, of reject stone, which is all totally viable. Somebody said that they bought in Sweden uh, a couple of granite quarries that have pink and green granite, which would have sold like hotcakes in 1983 for kitchen work surfaces. But nobody wants pink and green granite now, and it's really strong. You know, I actually think pink and green granite would be amazing for a, um, for a building. But, so the kind of popularity and the the modishness of, um, and the beige, uh, the beige obsession with beige, plasticky uh, marble and limestone. Um, yeah, there are piles and piles of unloved stone. The one in, um, the one at the RA, whichever way that was, sorry, I can't remember where this is. Uh, yeah, this thing, the ends, uh, the kind of high stress bits are recovered from a POMO building, granite, so it's like a red granite. And then in between, it's roach bed, Portland, that's the wrong color. Nobody wanted to buy it because it looks a bit concrete -y. So it's kind of reject stone and recovered stone from another building. We got it all for free because it's not really that expensive. But the minute you want to do it in Carrara or uh, Travertine or something else, then the price will go through the roof. And I think stone is by and large expensive because so much of it is rejected. And I think that's... Uh, Yeah, my money tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Will. 
Absolutely fascinating. Um, I have a question. I don't know whether it's, it's kind of a technical question in a way. Um, obviously, in, in your, post, your experiments with post-tensioning, you're replicating flap slabs and beams, and you similarly um, <laughs> talking about the... The feedback is a bit of a nuisance. I think it's because I'm right by the speaker. Um, yeah, so you're, you're, you're prim primarily concentrating on making flat slabs and beams with the post-tensioning. Post and then on the other hand, the sort of traditional form, as you said, of, of building with stone is to completely keep it in compression and arches and vaults and, and so on. And I wonder what the sort of structural economy is between those two kind of things. So, you know, if you have a post-tensioned uh, beam, but you give it a bit of curvature, <laughs> Does, yeah. does that help that much? Yeah, so another, well, another thing that I mean in, in architecture and design and structures in general, um, the form makes a massive difference to the effectiveness of the structure. So uh, Smithfield Poultry Market has a 75 millimetre concrete shell spanning 60 metres. And um, so obviously, if you, as you're right, you know, if you change the form, Philippe Block, you know, is in funicular structures. Um, if you make the form like that, it'll be far more efficient, and it'll be far more efficient in stone as in, um, uh, as in concrete, as in any other material. So the idea of um, uh, that traviated buildings are inherently inefficient is true. And the tyranny of the right angle and everybody <laughs> wanting flat floors and outrageous things like that is really not very helpful in terms of uh, economy. And uh, so thinking, um, you know, how do we get rid of concrete in the ground? I think actually um, circular basements are perfect. Mm -hmm. So if you make a circular or an elliptical basement, you can have a 100 millimeter stone wall going all the way around and it's, it's gonna be in compression, it's not gonna need any reinforcement and uh, uh, you dig huge basements with no carbon footprint at all. If they're circular, mm -hmm. they're rectangular, <laughs> piles, huge lumps of concrete everywhere, really inefficient. So um, yeah, there's definitely that, that thing, but um, I think Philippe Bloch, you know, is doing these amazing shells. He's quite limited in his application. And I think that's why I'm kind of more, like we intentionally made this thing look like a standard precast concrete beam because people are like, oh, that's a concrete beam. Oh, no, isn't it stone, you know? And so they can see the potential applicability of it. Whereas if we put, you know, like he did at Venice Biennale, the, um, limestone uh, vault, it's like, well, that's uh, an incredible curio, but no yes. good for my office block, you know? And, um, I was wondering if there's something uh, in between. <laughs> yeah, so well, perhaps, by just introducing yeah. a little bit of curvature, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, still yeah. post-tensioning, but, but yeah. giving it a bit of No, there's any, anywhere you move towards, fin funicular mean, uh, yeah, if, if you don't know, funicular means uh, to do with ropes. So if you, um, Adia, uh, Heinz Isler, no, not Heinz Isler, um, Gaudi is hanging yeah. chains and sandbags to Genius. work out the shape of Sacrada Familia. Heinz Isler is hanging um, things in his garden and letting them freeze overnight. So if you have a hanging structure, it'll work in compression. And that's a funicular structure. And funicular comes from to do with rope, I think. But um, yeah, so any kind of shell structure or any compromise between a, um, uh, a traviated structure and a shell of some kind is going to be more efficient. Thank Absolutely. You. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Um, what's the end of life uh, process for these um, buildings with um, reinforced stone? Um, so we, so this one, for example, we put it up in about four hours and we took it down and took it to bits and took it away again. Um, we're working on a building to, to build a, a modern, modernist building on the site of an old Victorian mansion. The Victorian mansion burned down and there's stone scattered everywhere from the cornices of the building. And we're recovering all of that stone, we're drilling holes through it, and we're post-tensioning it. So you can take the stones out, you can put them back in again, you can keep using them, you can fill the holes up, and you can re-drill them. So, uh, so legal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, we really want to cut it as little as possible and keep it in its maximum feasible size, and then it can be, it'll have a longer life because of that, rather than sticking it straight in the crusher the minute it comes out of the ground. Thank you so much, Steve. That was a fantastic lecture. Thank you. That was yeah. brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.